So one thing that's really exciting about what you're doing with the reactor, it's called Aurora, is that you guys actually can reuse existing nuclear fuel. I guess we can take stuff that's in existing nuclear power plants, it's been used from them, and, it, and, it's, and it's waste now, and, and we could use that to power the United States for how many years? Yeah, for over 100 years. So we have over 100 years of ability to power the United States just using the nuclear waste we already have. Yeah. With no extra carbon output or anything. None. It's amazing, right? This is a vast energy reserve that we think of as a waste right now, as something that's a liability, as something that people are sometimes afraid of. And in practice, with these advanced technologies, like what we're doing, it's called a fast reactor. The reason we call it a fast reactor is because when you, when you split an atom, the neutrons you release, which typically are two to three each time that happens, uh, they're born going pretty fast, a couple percent of the speed of light, right? Um, but in today's reactors, we slow them down uh, bouncing them off things like water, the hydrogen and water, and that makes them easier to be absorbed, caught, if you will, yep. by atoms and fuel. Um, great. You need less fuel as a result. Fast reactors, you don't slow them down. You let them run as they're born fast, which means they're harder to catch. You need a little more fuel, but because they're going faster, they're carrying more energy, and that allows you to much more efficiently actually split atoms that form a significant part of the waste profile, which are these things beyond uranium in the periodic table. We call them transuranic actinides. So, so there's tran transuranic actinides that can only be split by these fast neutrons. Right. So you're able to actually use waste more efficiently than others. Yeah. So what are the biggest objections to what you're doing? A lot of people, they're just, a lot of people are just negative on nuclear and say, oh, it doesn't work and it's too expensive and it's too dangerous. Like, but, but, but what, 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 what are the, what are, like steal me on the objections for me. Like what are the smart yeah. objections to what you're doing? Yeah. Well, I think one of the interesting things, you know, is, I mean, the economic side and the timeline side are some things that people bring up. The interesting thing to me is the people that bring those up are the people who also actively work to make those more expensive and harder. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, 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 the same people who are trying to regulate this to make it impossible yeah. are saying, oh, you can't do it because it's it's so regulated and it takes so long. Yep. And then they just try to keep it And they're like, let's make the regulations really hard. Right. What, where are they coming from on this? You know, it's it's an interesting background of I think old, antiquated, very outdated views of the technology that's that's often just tied to some Cold War era. Like Chernobyl, this is they think Chernobyl and they're afraid. Yeah, and I don't even you know I think it's yeah it's really tied to this kind of emotive response based and uh, experiences from decades ago. Um, and I find what people are realizing more and more, and I think what's really exciting is more and more people are realizing the importance that nuclear provides in terms of reliability of power, which I think more and more people are recognizing, but also clean, which it's reliable. Well, it's clean to me if someone believes that global warming is a big challenge and then they, and then they haven't looked they don't believe in nuclear it seems like maybe they're not serious about the global warming right stuff. i mean it's and that's what's that's what's kind of encouraging right now is we've had a shift where you know i think you see some of the policymakers. you know climate change gets treated as this this political football it's always really weird when you have people who sometimes would talk about climate change as if uh it was the big existential threat but then be not supportive of nuclear plants or sh wanting to shut them down or you have people who who wouldn't recognize climate change really happening but then be big supporters of nuclear it was a very interesting dynamic but now that's kind of bridged across and i think this is one of those areas where there's huge bipartisan support right now which is really exciting what it, what, what are the polling numbers like what percentage of people support this time technology right now. And, and if they, obviously if we educate them, it would probably go up, but like, but what yeah. is it right now? You know, I, oh man, the latest polling, I, I actually don't know off the top of my head. It um, seems like it's the majority these days. It is the though, majority. Which was not the case in the seventies. People not were freaked all. out about this stuff. Exactly. It's really changed. It is the majority. I mean, the information age to use a silly term has, has really opened up the opportunity for people to learn. One of the really interesting things I thought that happened and kind of anecdotally, but, but what we observed was after that show Chernobyl came out, I was worried at first cause it was like, oh man, people are going to see this and then have all these misconceptions and it's probably going to be a horribly done show that was fully inaccurate and it was actually better than i thought there's still inaccuracies but um the thing that was interesting to me was a lot of people then took the takeaway from that is wow communism and the soviet union were awful yes uh and it's like yeah it's a good takeaway yeah <laughs> and it was and then they were like in nuclear power like that thing was crazy up in chernobyl but that's really really cool what it does it's like really important because they, they're able to actually look up the facts right because that's, that's available today in short summary chernobyl was people managing it screwing up and multiple crazy ways. Oh man. Yeah. You have like a terrible system in place where you, you know, an autocratically dictatorial system on running the plants, um, poor choices and technology that were old and rushed forward. Um, ironically like quotas in place for before May day, um, to rush testing so that you had inexperienced staff running a test in a bad manner. And that's when everything, you know, got out of control. Just a lot of things combined that were wrong with systematic an old, failures with an old design that yep. was, that was much more easily able to have, have trouble. Yeah. And largely any 
if you think about it, there were other plants like that that did operate fine. So it was mostly a symptom of human error, um, largely. As a Although no one system. wants human error to be able to lead something that crazy, which is partially why you designed this now. That even if yeah. humans screw up, this thing this thing shuts itself down. Yeah, and it's interesting, right? When you design a system like that, you minimize the things people can even do with it, which is a great thing because human error typically has kind of a limit in terms of how you know, it, it ends up being the problem. Um, especially when you put physics on your side, things like gravity don't just randomly turn off. Um, so part of the reason we started the American optimist is to push back against the cynicism and pessimism. Uh, there's just all sorts of people saying, Oh, I don't want to have kids because the future of the world's going to be dystopian and the environment's going to be broken. And, uh, obviously Oclo as this like really exciting nuclear technology that could run the whole country for a hundred years, just on waste power and is, is extremely safe. It seems like it should be giving people some optimism. Like, 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 is, like how should we be like, how should people be thinking? about Oclo and like what's possible for the future of our country. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing because we have this technology that's been done before. And the question really is scaling this. This is an inevitability. Like at the end of the day, the shift towards clean energy, the shift towards affordable and reliable power, all of those things are happening for various reasons that are ultimately driving, I think, a better planet at the outcome because you combine cleaner air and water with energy abundance that's also affordable and reliable. I mean, that's everything, right? That's everything. And you think about the fundamental determinant I can't say the fundamental, but one of the main determinants in, in human quality of life is the access to energy. And so if we can bring that forward in a way that's sustainable and clean, which is what we're working to do with our technology, like you fix those problems. Actually, I was flying uh, on the, the plane the other day and looked down and we saw one of those giant solar farms that has like the tower in the middle. It looks yeah. really cool, but it made me think, you know, there's a tremendous attention on renewable energy, but it just takes a huge amount of land to have a low carbon future with winning with solar to tell us a little bit about like how much space you need for power output and, you know, for versus these other technologies. Yeah. It's, it's one of the really cool things about nuclear is, you know, by and large you can use 10 to 100, 100 times less land, uh, to make the energy that you would otherwise get from other sources, um, which is pretty powerful and advanced vision only becomes even more sustainable. So those numbers even go smaller. So it's a, it's a pretty phenomenal effective land use, uh, kind of sustainability perspective. I think you gave us a chart. It said 250,000 acres of wind is the same as 150,000 acres of solar is like, is what? It's is like a like, thousand or less acres uh, of nuclear. Yeah, nuclear yeah. In some cases, I think for, with advanced reactors, that number drops, you know, maybe into the hundreds. It depends a little bit on specific siting and configurations, but yeah, and it's just a huge, huge difference. Um, and the other cool thing about it is, is the material intensiveness. Like we think oftentimes, you know, about, oh, okay. Nuclear plants are these big systems that we see today, and advanced systems are going to be different and smaller. But at the end of the day, nuclear today and nuclear in the future, is even even more so, uses the least materials. Yeah, people don't realize that to build this solar and these wind farms, you're putting out ridiculous amounts of carbon, tons of money. Yeah. And you it's actually going to be a lot less intensive on the environment to build the nuclear plants. So. Yeah, and people, sometimes this is one of the, the interesting criticisms that people sometimes bring up is like, oh, well, nuclear is not zero carbon in the life cycle. Well, I think at the end of the day, we're probably going to be electrifying most of the equipment and mining and construction. So yeah, you'll get there. But even before that, when you're talking about a fuel source that's millions of times more energy dense than anything else, that's going to be the best way to be most efficient. It's <laughs> yeah. going to be the best way to be zero carbon. If the least materials needed, it's of course going to have the least, uh, the lowest carbon footprint. And, so. and, there, and there's enough of this material to last us for thousands of years around the world. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a couple ways you can kind of do the math, but, but really thinking broadly from somewhat of a, like a geo statistical perspective, um, and I think I maybe made that word up, but the geologically statistical perspective, there's enough uranium and thorium in the planet to power, you know, humankind at a 10 billion population uh, number using us per capita energy consumption right now for, for millions, if not billions of years. Wow. So, um, millions of years. so there's, there's no scarcity here of this no. zero carbon energy source. We just have to be not dumb enough to regulate it out of existence.